And we are we are live right now. We are. Hey, hey, everybody, how's it going? Um, Greg unfortunately is unable to be here, but today we have uh, somebody that many of you know. His name is Sean Nielsen, and um, so we're gonna just have a little conversation here. I just, how are you doing, Sean? I'm doing pretty good, but yeah. I was a little worried when I came in. I saw that you had a shovel on the back of your Jeep. <laughs> it wasn't. A sh it's actually one of those metal rakes. Oh. Yeah, and I it guess belongs, I should have it does, It's a great lead-in. It does belong to somebody in the church. I don't know why you brought brought it to church here, but it's sitting. it was sitting by the door, and I brought it home because I have a gravel driveway that goes downward. So as I'm driving my Jeep up the driveway, um, it kicks a lot of the rocks, and it digs kind of... You could maybe go a little wheels. bit slower. Well, no, because... Uh, if I don't go at a regu at, at a certain pace, mm -hmm. um, I get I will spin my wheels because of all the gravel because it's 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 pretty inclined. So is and, that why you need a jeep? And I'm also going backwards like this um, because I drive down into the driveway and I come back up this way. And there's trees on both sides of the driveway, so you kind of have to watch out for traffic uh, neighborhood neighbors going back and forth. And so when I see an opening, I kind of bust it up. Oh. So oh. anyway, I took the rake home. Uh, I was lazy yesterday, <laughs> and I didn't use it, so I'm just going to keep it in my Jeep and then maybe do that tonight. I got small group tonight, barbecue, so maybe we'll see I'll, Friday. Uh, it's here. If it's your rake, uh, metal rake, there's two of them, actually. One of them is sitting in, uh, by the door, the, and one is in the back of my Jeep. Nice. Yeah. So nothing to be afraid of, though. Okay. I just didn't know. I mean, it's my first time on here, so I didn't know... <laughs> If the uh, shovel meant something, or a rake for that it matter. It, it feels like it's my first time out here. Uh, what um, We're going to get into some other stuff here, but what do you know about um, what's going on here at Northridge these days? We're just going to kind of jump into it because uh, with, without Greg here. Um, Probably not as much as I should know, but maybe some good things that would be good to know is what's happening with the building yeah what kind of things are going on there yeah actually greg and i i don't know if i'm allowed to say this uh greg and i just got some news well greg um greg got some news <laughs> we've been waiting for confirmation from the school to okay to park over okay. there during the building and it's just you know how things take time we just needed an official letter to give to the city well we just got that letter yesterday and we're going to get that to the city and hopefully that'll be all that they need to with the thumbs up on oh, cool. getting things going. So things are trending upward, and uh, hopefully we'll be breaking ground on that soon, hopefully before Ben and Terry even get back. That would be a really wonderful surprise for them by the time they get back. This that would be. People are starting working on the building. And for those of you that don't know, uh, starting Monday, Ben and Terry began their sabbatical. Um, hmm. Watch last week's uh, podcast. I had Ben on here, and we talked about his sabbatical, what he hopes to do, what what kind of the point of it is, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that started Monday. It's kind of funny. After Sunday church, um, I was sitting here talking to a couple people. I wanted to say goodbye to him because it's going to be 11 weeks. That's a long time. It's a long time. And it's the first time in his life, in his history, that he's ever... Did you cry a little bit? Take, no, I didn't cry. No. Okay. <laughs> but he, the, him and Terry took off like right away <laughs> after church was over. I wanted to go say goodbye to him, and they were gone. Um, so good for them. Good for them. They deserve it. And, it. and again, it's not just 11 weeks of vacation. It's 11 weeks of a, an intentional um, time away from the ins and outs and the day-to-day -day stuff of Northridge to give them the space to, to think about things from a bird's eye you know, view, a, a mm -hmm. longer-term future uh, perspective. And so go watch last week's. Um, how long have you been coming here to Northridge, Sean? Christine and I... My wife uh, started coming here in 2005. 2005. Yep. So met with Pastor Ben, asked him like 750 questions. <laughs> um, but Christine and I wanted a place to call home, and we believe in really being a part of a community. Both of us grew up in a, in a small town uh, called Rockford. That's near here. Um, we wanted to, again, just be able to be a part of a body and really enjoyed how Ben and Terry looked at things and then also just the feel of the church, just that people were pretty normal. Cool. Were you guys meeting over across the street at the school at the time, right? 
Or were you? I think we were here, then we went there, and then we came back here. <laughs> it's uh, it's been quite the relationship with the city over the the years before mm-hmm. being officially in the building. Yeah, it's it's always interesting. I mean, like you know, a church in a box or whatever. Had you, you ever call done it. that before, previous to Northridge? Yep, you've done, done a done church that. plant. Okay. Yeah, and didn't necessarily want to be a part of one. And actually, when Ben Ben actually contacted me in 2000, not 2005, but 2000. I don't know if when they first started the church. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know this. Yep, because I, Christine and I went to Woodridge Church um, back from like 92 to 96. Wow. Yeah. Didn't know that. Yeah, you were probably if you went there, you were probably really young. You were probably at least two or three inches (laughs) shorter than what you are. Speaking of which, if you notice, we're about the same. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We're about the same height, and if you know Sean, nobody, like very few people in the church are the same height as Sean, because um, the average height, Greg, of <laughs> the person at Northridge is about six feet, and Sean is what, six five? Six five. Yeah, yep. and so uh, oftentimes Sean sings on the worship team on, on occasion, and, and I have to put him on the way other side of the stage so it doesn't make me look or so, behind the drummer. such a dwarf. I think you've tried behind the drummer. <laughs> have right? I tried that? No. No, okay. Um, but <laughs> please. <laughs> okay. I raise you up. Even Is that more. better? Nope, a little more. Uh, like more normal. There. That's that's not even more normal. That's well, still about eye to eye. I want to make you look bigger. Oh, well, I'm just merely. Be humble. Andy Schultz. I know you are, but it's Andy Schultz yeah. nonetheless. So you were Northridge 2000, <laughs> or not Northridge, Woodridge. Woodridge. And 2000, Ben got a hold of you. Yeah, and he called and said, you know, tried a real soft sales pitch, like, do you want to be a part of a church plant? And so I did said, you know Ben when he was at Woodridge? No. Okay. No, he just kind of called out of the blue, but I knew who he was through another friend that was at Woodridge. And I told him no, and don't ever call back. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so different circumstances um, brought us to a point where he was a pastor that I very much trusted in the Rogers area. And then and you were um, at New Joy at the time. At New Joy. Okay. And then um, Scott Whitman was also another friend. And Scott was, I'm going to just explain it. Scott was much more like a poodle <laughs> jumping at the door. Would you like to come to Northridge now? <laughs> How about now? <laughs> How about now? <laughs> <laughs> and after a while, um, just couldn't take it anymore, and we finally said yes. No, that's he's more like a beagle these days, right? These saying? days, yeah, he's over fifty, <laughs> <laughs> fifty-two. I think he's actually getting AARP benefits, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Oh, Scott. Um, but anyway, a good good friend of Scott, and then Ben, and just felt like this was a place to call home. So, and we've kind of been here and dug into the trenches in different ways over the years since '05. Since oh five. That's awesome. I had a lot less gray hair. A lot less gray hair. Yep. There's there's sort of some like edging. Yeah. <laughs> I call it sable, actually. <laughs> um so I got I came I started coming around in two thousand ten. And um when I first started interviewing, I remember very distinctly my first interview, I pulled up into the parking lot and I looked at the building, I'm like, wow, this will be interesting. Because th- from the outside, the building wasn't, it, it's still, I mean, with even, the, we had the additions and all that stuff. Yeah. And they've updated uh, the outside grounds a little bit. But um, 10 years ago, it was pretty kind of not flattering. And uh, I, oftentimes what I do, and this is a, a personal flaw of mine, is I judge the book by the co- <laughs> by the cover and I looked at the building. I'm like, oh, this will be interesting. And I walked in into this atrium, and uh, it changed almost instantly. My attitude changed. What? Why did it change? Um, just the warmth, the colors, the tones. And um, I don't know if you asked that un- intentionally, because one of the reasons it changed was I looked at the wall, and there was these pictures in these frames, these clear frames. And if you've been into the building, you see these. Uh, around the, the outer edge of the atrium and then all the way down the hallway are pictures. And at the time, they were just candid pictures of people. Right now, we have our mission partners in there in the frames, but at the time, it was just, um, I didn't know these people, but I assumed that they were Northridge people, P- 
people that went to church here that mm-hmm. were part of this, this community. And it just drew me into this sense of community and family. Um, and then combine that with just how they renovated the inside of the, the space here. Um, and so that's why I have Sean here <laughs> today is it, for those of you that don't know, Sean is a photo- photographer. He, he has his own photography business and he is the one who's, um, those are his pictures over the years. And some of them, sometimes they've been uh, f- portraits. Uh, some of, sometimes they've just been candids. Right now they're mission partners. There was a season where he, um, he took some really abstract photos and had people's favorite scripture on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's kind of his space to, to do some real uh, subtle ministry because I see people stopping and looking at them all the time. And whether they're reading about the mission partners, reading the scripture, or just um, being taken in by the the genuineness of the of the people in the pictures, and and so that's that's all Sean, and um, I just thought it was really cool. And I've had the privilege of having him on the worship team over the years. We've been f- becoming friends over the years, and I just thought it'd be fun to have you. I think here, you want so. to change the friendship thing. Now, right? <laughs> change the change the friendship status. It's okay. okay. It's acquaintance. Not, not like go steady or anything like that. But. Why is Sean sitting on the ground? Hey, say hi to Kit. Hi, Kit. And say hi to Greg. I'm not sitting on the ground. I'm just trying to be more <laughs> five foot six. Are you five six? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're almost the same. It's just inverted. I'm You're five six. myself <laughs> out a little bit there. Yeah. Um, so. Before we get to, I've just got some fun questions to ask Sean to get to know him better. I uh, just want to let you know of a couple things. This weekend, still have church. We don't have any youth, don't have any kids all the way up to, if you have kids up through kindergarten, you can bring them and they'll have a spot over with Jackie. But uh, we still have the weekend services, even though the 4th of July is on Sunday. When's the last time 4th of July has been on a Sunday morning? Maybe Sunday? seven years ago. Is that how it I think works? it's like every seven, seven it's, it cycles. There's this thing <laughs> called a calendar, oh. and I think it flips. It always surprises me, though. like especially when uh, Christmas falls on like a Sunday or Saturday. Yeah, that always throws me off. Um, which does it feel more religious or less religious when it's on a Sunday? <laughs> I don't know the last time I felt really, really religious, but uh, it just is more. It's it changes the schedule <laughs> for me, um, and I actually would prefer it if Christmas Eve was on a Saturday. Why? I don't like that. You like that better? No, I don't, because then Christmas Day is on a Sunday. And I don't <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we ha- Christmas d- Christmas Eve has been on a, has been on Sunday, of course. Um, and that's always interesting because we, we feel like we want to do a, the Sunday morning services, mm-hmm. but then we also feel like we have to do the Christmas Eve services later that day. So it honestly works better if Christmas Eve is in the middle of the week. See, I, just, I think you need a shirt like my wife got me that says, hold on, let me overthink this. Because <laughs> I think that's what you're doing, Andy. <laughs> well, that's uh, the story of my life. But I don't know why she got that for me. So, <laughs> Or do you? I don't know. I'm not going to think about it. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so around Northridge, we got services this weekend. Pastor Greg, who, by the way, is in in absence of Ben and Terry, he is uh, the man in charge. Whoa. He's, can I say man? He's the person in charge. <laughs> he's a man. I mean, he's got a uh, beard and stuff. Yeah, uh, I'm just joking. A significant I don't want any testosterone, I think. Don't, I don't get mad at me. Don't email me hate mail for... Um, anyway. Is it is male spelled M A I L or M A L E? <laughs> male chimp. Um, <laughs> there's service this weekend. Greg, Pastor Greg is preaching. We started a new series called Get Real. I'm looking at the walls to see if I can find the poster. There it is. Here's a poster. Um, uh, it's all in the Psalms. And by the way, we're not going in order. I know Pastor Ben started with Psalm 1 last week. Doesn't mean we're going to go to Psalm 2 and then 3. It would take probably four years to get through them all. Um, Four? No, it wouldn't take. Is that in people years or 60, dog years? How many weeks are in a year? Six how many weeks? Fifty-six. Fifty-two. 52. <laughs> is that is that in a 
Korean calendar is 56 <laughs> or <laughs> uh, Swedish calendar. Um, no, Swedish would 52 leave. divided by 150. How many weeks? Uh, I'm a photographer, know. dude. Three years, it's three like and a half years. Anyway, Greg's going to be preaching on Psalm 133 and it's going to be good. So you're still welcome to come or join us online. It'd be great. Uh, other stuff I want to let you know is youth. There's a bunch of activities throughout the summer, including if you are going into sixth grade, they're going to have a special event for you. Um, they're just trying to shore up the details. So uh, keep an eye out for when those details come out. It's going to be a great day. It's, I, I believe that there's going to be some water, some skiing, some bonfire, all that kind of stuff. So definitely want to get in on that if you're going into sixth grade. Um, 132 doesn't, don't matter. Oh, Psalm 2 through 132 don't matter. <laughs> I said that? <laughs> uh, Greg, he's, see, he's doing 2 through 132 all in one. No, he just said, quote, Psalm 2 through 132 don't matter. And then oh. quoted me. Oh, I didn't know if, if he was going to like that. do it at auctioneer speed kind of thing. <laughs> or. Um, other youth events, if you go to their website, there's a list of events that's going to be happening throughout the summer. And uh, so you want to make sure you stay on top of that to get your kids something to do this, this summer. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, July 22nd, it's a Thursday night, we have Out of the Dust. Have you heard of Out of the Dust, Sean? I have. I've been to two of their concerts. You've been to here come, yeah. when they've been here in the past? I think they've been here not last summer because the COVID stuff, but each of the last two summers before that. And we first heard about them from our friends, uh, Phil and Teresa Whiteford. Whiteford. Yep. They went on a cruise retreat, marriage retreat on a cruise. It sounds, you know, pretty nice. And they were one of the artists on the ship. That's how they met them. So they invited them to Northridge and then they came a couple years in a row. They're wonderful. They have this powerful story. Uh, their marriage has been quite a journey, and they share a lot about their personal story, uh, which is also interwoven into the, the music that they write. And the music is so creative because yeah. they're both extremely talented. He's an amazing guitar player. Uh, he used loops. They use um, other instruments. She sometimes plays this little tiny keyboard that has, like, bass. I don't like know. It's loops as in, like, a rope? Or <laughs> loops like as in this repeated so he'll play something on the guitar that will loop and then he'll it'll just re -re it repeats out by itself and then he'll play something else that'll go with that and it repeats itself if you ever heard of Ed Sheeran Ed Sheeran really made this popular one man kind of act and he could um, record a bunch of loops on top of each other and make it sound like he's a part of a full band yeah. and so he does that uh, Chris and then they sing, they're just, their harmonies are amazing, but it's really mostly about just their incredible story of redemption. And so that's July 22nd at seven o'clock. It's free uh, for anybody. Uh, so you can come, you can invite friends. I would encourage you to invite uh, a neighbor or a coworker. It, it's a great event to invite somebody who maybe wouldn't normally go to church because it's not this overly churchy night. It's yep. just listening to people tell their story through music. And then there's going to be ice cream afterwards. You can stay and hang out, fellowship, get some ice cream. They got a bunch of their merchandise, CDs. You know, if you really like their music, you want to take it home with you. She does have a prettier voice than you, too. She, well, there's, that's not hard to do. <laughs> um, I also, I did know what a loop was. I just wanted to hear you geek out for a little bit. just wanted to throw me for a loop. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> July twenty second, seven o'clock. Um, come, and if you can, if you want, you can go to Facebook. I created an event for it yesterday, and just let us know you're interested in coming. You're like almost a millennial, creating like events and stuff. <sighs> Trying not to be. <laughs> uh, I'm just outside of the age bracket of millennial. Uh, I think. Uh, Can we combine two words? I don't know what it would be. I mean, what would be your previous generation? Because I'm like over fifty. I'm just. I'm a little bit under fifty, so I don't know. Mine would be. Um, so are you a Gen Xer? Or I don't. I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know either. I don't. I don't identify as a Gen Xer. I don't. I don't even know what I would identify as. <laughs> I don't either. Maybe a lumberjack or something like that. But 
Ooh, that's that's a deep cut. It is. Remember, remember the lumberjacks, everybody. We can't be on stage anymore. Ben said so. <laughs> <laughs> Had something to do with cooking a sunfish on stage. I <laughs> with think. the blowtorch. <laughs> with the blowtorch. Yeah, uh, I don't know what could have gone wrong. Uh, I didn't see any problem with it, other a, than it stunk a little bit. I do have a question, Andy. Do yeah. you always match your shirt to your hat? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and I sometimes even, uh, oh gosh, I can't believe I say this. When I wake up on a Sunday morning, depend on what guitars I was playing, and I, I try to coordinate. You do know <laughs> that people are going to be watching this now. <laughs> but I, cor- I just, like, if I'm wearing brown, I'll use, you know, or if I'm playing certain guitars, like if I have a black guitar, I'll try to wear something that matches. Yeah, anyway. Don't you have, like, one that kind of has a yellow glow from the inside? Uh, it's kind of what's called a sunburst. Yeah. yeah. I think you should get a sunburst shirt. Yeah. <laughs> like a tie-dye? Yeah. <laughs> It'll look uh, awesome on stage. Uh, yeah. Tie-dye. <clears throat> um, you ever made a tie-dye shirt? I have. Yeah. I'm not very good. Outside of, like, photography, I can't draw. I can't really do many things with, like, tie-dyeing. Yeah. I don't. I could probably mess up a tie-dye shirt, too. Yeah, it's somehow not, messing that kind of thing up. Visual. Yeah. Speaking of artist, artist, art, artistic, tar- artistic. You can do it, Andy. Um, expressions. Stop it. I don't know what that means. The end of this series that we're in, get real. Psalm one. We're going to do Psalm one forty-five to one fifty, all on Labor Day weekend. And the big part of the reason for that is. Um, from 145 to 150 is pretty much all the same th- theme, and that's just worship. Mm-hmm. And so that so the services for that weekend, it's 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 going to be kind of a, just a worship musical ex- worship expression service. You're doing an all Gregorian chant, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's gonna so just warning you, there's not going to be a real official sermon. Okay. There's going to be some reading of those ser- those psalm. Um, but there's also going to be expressing those psalms in different ways, either through the music. Uh, I'd also like to, if you are art- visually, artistically talented, like you paint or you draw, I would love for you to get a hold of me um, to be able to do that during the service. Oh, that would be really cool. During the music, just kind of on the side of the stage. Um, so come, come talk to me. If you'd like to paint or draw uh, or create, maybe it's... I don't know what else. Uh, it seems like painting or drawing. Painting, drawing. You could do like clay work. Clay could be work. Another thing. You probably can't. It wouldn't make sense to go creative writing up there while we're. <laughs> um, if Scott Whitman did it, or you could it, come it in and you could just take pictures of people during the music. I could. <laughs> I could take pictures. I, any, any, see, do I have to the make thing? them look normal though? <laughs> no, because <laughs> um, any expression I think that we do that comes from a place inside of us that is directed towards God mm-hmm. could be considered worship. Yep. And and so we like to try to make it clear that music isn't the only means to worship God. Right. Uh, the definition that we use is worship is our response. So any way that you would respond back to God, uh, even the way that you fulfill your duties at your job, um, bowling, if you bowl for the glory of God, uh, or you sing a song, or you... You just have to stay out of the gutter. <laughs> or you... Uh, man, how you manage your finances or parent your kids. Those mm-hmm. are all forms of responses that are changed or fashioned in a way because of your awareness and knowledge of who God is seems like as humans, though, we want to try to put it in the line like singing or you up on a stage yeah. strumming your guitar and singing is the act of worship. Yeah. Well, I, you, I, used, I used to kind of do a double take. It's probably a little bit more harsh than just a double take, but uh, I don't want to say that. Like when you label it a worship service, like, our, you know, like going by a church sign, it says our worship service times. Mm-hmm. I just... Yeah, it's worship is going to happen there, but it's not, I don't know. There's so many more avenues of worship than just coming to a, a church service and singing some songs. Mm-hmm. So anyway, 
if you are artistically gifted and you want to share that with the church um, for the glory of God, uh, email me uh, or just type in the comments or stop me after church on the weekends or call me, whatever you want, Labor Day weekend, that Saturday and Sunday, and it could be only just for one service. So I'd like maybe three to six people because um, I could have one or two at each service. It would be really cool. And you would just read Psalm 145 to 150 or pick an idea in those psalms and um, express that through whatever art artistic expression that, you, um, that you're strong at. So if I could really draw stick men really well, would that If they were do doing that? something like 1 Psalm 45 or 146 or 147 or 148, 149 or 150. Um, so anywhere in there, if I could yeah. figure out how to do stick men for Jesus, yeah, basically. Be some pretty amazing stick people. Because that's all I can really <laughs> draw. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one thing that would be really cool is to have Brax do some of his whiteboard Oh, stuff. He's pretty decent. Have you ever at that seen stuff. his uh, teachings for the youth? I haven't. I have the gray hair. I haven't gone down and looked at it. You, they are actually, if you go to um, Northridge, has a youth page. Northridge Impact. I think some of them have been put up on our life. Oh, and he did a whiteboard during one of his the sermons that he did a while back. I remember because yeah, he had the whiteboard up there. Um, yeah. And he was using it in his teaching, but this is a little different because he, he, we've been going through the book of John in the youth group on Wednesday nights, and for a lot of the chapters, he'll uh, do this sped up whiteboard drawing. Oh, cool. Where he narrates voiceovers, kind of telling the story of what's going on in that particular chapter. And it, yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, I remember the sermon. It was like the squeak of the marker helped bring the points home. <laughs> I don't remember what the points were. but I, You remember the squeak, though. I do remember the squeak. Yeah. I probably thought of something visual at that stand, that point in time. And um, Other than that, the summer is always a really awesome time just to um, hang out, enjoy the weather, enjoy... Uh, I mean, I, I know that we're a little less busy. I know people are still busy. Mm -hmm. um, some people just can't help themselves, <laughs> and they have to be busy. And that doesn't count. Like, jobs go all year round. Kids are out of school, but, you know, they do still have some activities. Like, your kids are involved in theater. Yep. Um, there's still sports going on. I know Greg's daughter plays soccer. Um, some baseball stuff going on. But uh, there is a, seems to be a little bit more w margin and a little bit more yep. um, wiggle room to just take a breath, relax. Kind of rest, sit around a campfire. Sit around the campfire, go out on the boat, sit on the lake. Eat s'mores. Eat s'mores. You like the campfire thing, right? I do, yeah. yeah. I also really like root beer. Like 1919 root beer. Root like, beer. That's probably the best one I've tasted. I probably should try some others. What's the difference between root beer and sarsaparilla? I don't know, but I like root beer when it says root beer. <laughs> <laughs> I just I like saying it's sarsaparilla. Sarsaparilla? Yeah. You need to have your cowboy Makes boots you want to talk with the West, you know, southern accent. Western southern accent? Western. <laughs> Southwestern. <laughs> Southwestern accent. We'll just go with that. Like you're from Colorado. <laughs> yeah. Or Arizona, New Mexico. Arizona doesn't even know what time zone they're in, so that doesn't help. I feel like cultural appropriation. Um, any Anything that you're looking forward to this summer just for you and your family, your life? I think um, just being together. Sometimes we like to take hammocks, and I don't know. People say hammock or hammock. So I know there's probably a right way and a wrong way to say it, um, but sometimes we'll just hang them up in the trees, and then we'll have a campfire, and then we'll have s'mores. Yes. I still like s'mores. Have you, ever, have you ever done anything cool creative with s'mores, or is it just your pretty standard marshmallow, Hershey chocolate, graham cracker? You do the marshmallow first. How do you do the marshmallow first? <laughs> no, I'm just saying. I do chocolate. The contents of the s'more. Right. So I do graham cracker as base, chocolate, and then marshmallow. You you said that you graham cracker, marshmallow, chocolate. No, I said marshmallow first. You sure? Yeah, yeah. Marshmallow, Hershey, graham cracker. And this is what I mean. Don't you, you do two graham crackers? 
<laughs> like a sandwich, <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. So you roast the marshmallow first, right? And then you get the chocolate and the graham cracker ready. So when when it's done, you could smush the marshmallow and yeah. pull, pull it off of the steak. So are you the kind of guy that just like burns your marshmallow to a crisp, yeah, or do you kind of go golden brown? Yeah. What kind of person are you? Put in the chat. How do you like your marshmallow? Yeah, done? I like. I think it's biblical, actually. <laughs> I don't mind frying the crap out of it every once in a while. You um, do know that you just said crap. Yeah. Oh, oops. That's okay. Um, They're but, on sabbatical. But there, there is a, uh, there is an art to getting a perfectly browned, toasted marshmallow. Mm-hmm. And one, you don't use the flame part. You get the coals, and it takes like a good. 34. Jennifer said burn. She likes to burn. <laughs> Somebody already is uh, chiming in. Uh, you get the coals that a. a, a developed over like a good 45 minutes to an hour yep. and then you kind of create this bed of coals and then you just you know good three feet off that and just kind of mm-hmm. slowly rotate it spin it that gets the insides nice and melty the outside nice and brown so that's probably to, the way i'd prefer it yeah i used to be just like torture right away because there was like no patience just, <laughs> just, just water it in my mouth yeah <laughs> almost while it's flaming and then my wife was like it needs to be golden brown, and, and then it's almost like a whole religion in and of itself, I think. Yeah. But it was then you realize that the inside of it actually is so, kind of melted, and it gets the chocolate yeah. a little more gooey. Yeah. So I think it's it's worth it to be patient and yeah. not just like increase your carcinogen level <laughs> <laughs> by totally making I, a charm. I think it's heard that all those charcoals is good for your. Your digestive system. Oh, yeah, like uh, water filters have charcoal yep. in them too, right? Yeah, yeah. That might work. Have you ever tried uh, Peeps <coughs> instead of marshmallows? You, you mean ever, like over the fire? Yeah. I've seen you ever them like roasted where you peeps? puff them up in the microwave. but <laughs> No. Have you ever roasted Peeps on Mm-mm. the fire? Um, we were going to do it a couple of years ago before Brax was officially the our youth pastor here. I was Can you not do that kind of thing after you become a youth pastor? Or <laughs> what? No, no, well, no, I was I was the one kind of in charge on Wednesday nights, and so for the oh. end of the year party, um, I had planned out um, just a bunch of food, bunch of games, give giveaways, stuff like this, and then also out in the parking lot, I called the city to make sure I had a bunch of uh, so those wrought iron fire pits. Mm-hmm. I, had, I was planning on roasting uh, all sorts of stuff, roasting oh. uh, some. Hot dogs, roasting some marshmallows. I bought a bunch of peeps, and um, it nice. downpoured that night, oh. so we couldn't do <laughs> we couldn't do any of that, uh, which is a pretty big bummer. Um, so I have yet to still eat a roasted peep, which, aside from roasting it, which I still haven't had, I, peeps are disgusting. Mm-hmm. But it it's it, it's kind of weird because it's just sugar coated with sugar. They kind of seem on the same <laughs> level as like a Twinkie that they might have a half life. You know, like you could. Set them aside, and they could be used in a fallout shelter yeah, for Twinkies. sustaining. What movie was that where they found a box of Twinkies? I don't know. After, like, in the middle of a zombie apocalypse. I don't. <laughs> I think it was uh, Zombie Land, the first Zombie Land. Yeah, with uh, Woody Harrelson. I'm much more of a Grizzly Adams kind of guy. Grizzly Adams. Have yeah. you ever seen Harry and the Hendersons? Yeah. Are you making a comment about how tall I am? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, I mean, I know I'm switching gears here a little bit, but you had said when you first came on as a worship leader that you were going to get um, oriental rugs for up front. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and I just think there should be equal representation of Swedish rugs <laughs> from Ikea. <laughs> yeah, they'd, they'd still come to you in like, 80 pieces <laughs> take you like two how hours to put together how to assemble that Swedish rug you gotta sew your own rug <laughs> it's art oh that's funny uh yeah that's been a thing of Sean and mine's for uh, nine years maybe is it, yeah Swedish at least rug. that long um yeah I didn't name the oriental rug either no. <laughs> um as you can see it really doesn't matter that much yeah. to me and it's been more fun than yeah. something to it's laugh hila- about it's pretty hilarious um is there anything specific that you'd like to accomplish this summer before, uh, it's, before it's finished? Not really. Just enjoying life. And okay. I think just being together with family and, you know, just having hamburgers and taking time just to be with one another. I think it's just time to, like you said, sit back and relax. I think uh, we run around 
what, like a what's the uh, phrase chicken with our head cut off so much of the time and when we finally have a time to relax we don't necessarily know how to do it well and I think it's just more taking time to do something like that with family and then with friends I think is important do you have chickens we had chickens you had chickens you cut all their heads off I I'm I'm not, I'm not at liberty to disclose. <laughs> Less Grizzly Adams. I will now neither <laughs> confirm nor deny. <laughs> uh, is there anything, um, I asked Ben this last week, is there anything new that you'd like to try this summer? Something you've never done before? He sort of gave me a cop-out answer. Yeah. Well, what do you mean cop-out? Like... I shouldn't say that. I mean, I don't want to. My make dad him, was a cop. I don't what do you mean ma- by that? <laughs> I don't want to make him feel bad. So I asked him if there's anything new that he was going wanted to try this summer, and then he said, um, "There, him and Terry are renting with Chrissy and Grant um, a gigantic sailboat. Okay, up in the to go up in the Boston Islands for a few days. But he's, you know, so I mean, it, it, I mean, in the nicest way, Ben, it, 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 it's it's he's sailed before a lot." He owns a sailboat, uh, but he's never sailed a boat this big. And he said it's it's so big <coughs> that uh, it has its own plumbing. Wow. Yeah. And so it's much different than sailing the little catamarans or whatever that he has. And I get that, but it's still sailing. So that's what I meant by cop-out. So is there anything new that you'd like to do? Your wife just typed in here, ask him about the Rum River. Oh, well, that's not new, but we'll get to that. Um, in terms of something new, I don't know. Oddly enough, I really like to kind of like stay in my lane with things. Um, <laughs> people probably think artists are kind of like fly by the seat of their pants kind of people. And it's like, well, at least not me, but I may be more <laughs> on the commercial side. Yeah. But I like things kind of like a, a certain way. Do you way. think that's changed the older you've gotten? Or do you think that... <laughs> I probably just act more like one of the two old guys from the Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> what are those guys' names again? You know, I don't remember. I don't either. I just always call them the two Muppet or old guys from the Muppets. Yeah, the old cur- um, curmudgeons. Curmudgeons. If you know what their names are, type them in the yeah, chat for me. Then we'd please. be wiser, yeah. and that kind of information yeah. can be used at smart random water. Time. Yes, it's <laughs> actually well water in my smart oh. water bottle. <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's doing more hiking, which is something that I've learned that I've liked over the last couple of years. I've tried to go to the Grand Canyon twice. Tried? Tried, yeah. Last year, that cute little thing called COVID happened. Oh, yeah. That's and forgot that kind of stopped. about that. Was all the way trained for it. And then this year, um, I ended up getting something that resembled COVID, which knocked me out of the game. Um, so then uh, we'll try for next year. So third time's a charm. You did recently just go down um, to Arizona? Yeah, we had plane tickets, so we thought, you know, let's use them. Hiking there. (laughs) Instead of (laughs) hiking there, I actually we went to Zion, and um, I took what I would consider uh, photo pullouts because I couldn't walk up the hill very much. So then I would take a opportunity to take a photo and take a breather, just because I wasn't used to the elevation or didn't have the stamina to walk. Do you know what the elevation was? Uh, Higher than Minnesota. <laughs> I think it was around six, five, five to six thousand yeah. feet, um, but it was just so beautiful and it's interesting. With my camera, I still couldn't get in all that Zion was and just how amazing creation is, mm. and just being able to see that and it's like. I right. bet you took some amazing pictures though. They're pretty decent. Yeah, yeah it's uh, and it's something that I actually experience where I'm at through the lens or yeah, through the lens of a camera or through my eye as a photographer. So Christine wanted me to talk about the Rum River. We had, uh, uh, we with our friends Scott and Terry Whitman, we're gonna um, kayak from Lake Mille Lacs down to um, somewhere just east of Princeton. And we got through kind of the first lakes after Mille Lacs, but actually I, I should have taken it as an omen. Um, we got into Lake Mille Lacs to come out to the Rum River where we'd do a portage and I was standing and I took a sidestep and Scott's boat actually hit me and knocked me fully into the water. And I'm, I thought it was funny and cute at the time because it's like, oh, I'm wet. Um, but then we, we went like 11 miles through the next three lakes that 
um, you end up coming down to Onamia, and then there's this next section that says kayaking or canoeing not advised uh, for this next mile section. And we're going, and it's like, okay, this is fine. There's nothing going on here. Well, it was the next 18 miles after that, uh, the river levels were so low that we would go about 200 feet in a kayak and then have to pull our kayak for another 100 Ugh. feet. Yeah, it wasn't fun. So we, uh, we had to call for an extraction, um, called their son to come get us at like 1030 at night. Um, and we were all bummed. And so we ended that. And then we decided that we're actually going to do for, quote, the second leg of it. We're actually going to go hike on the Superior Hiking Trail. Cool. From like Lutzen down to Temperance. So it should be about 17 miles. It's all downhill. So you should go from Temperance to Lutzen. <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's like this. <laughs> it's like the other way is kind of nice and down. Yeah. So so it should be fun. Awesome. Um, before we get into some of your photography <laughs> stuff, your your wife said those two guys, their name are Statler and Waldorf. <laughs> those are hilarious <laughs> they names. Go, they go by last names only. <laughs> I don't know what they're first or last, but uh, I never knew their names before. That's I, some if, Cliff Clavin level knowledge right there. Gun to my head. <laughs> I would never. I would, it'd be Statler like. Statler and Waldorf. Waldorf and Statler. Nice. Yeah, I don't know which one's which, but uh, you learn something new. So I've, I have a question while we're kind of on the Muppets, and my kids say it, and I mean, I hear it. Waka, waka, waka. No, oh, okay. they've said that I sound like Kermit the Frog. I always thought I sounded like Kermit the Frog when I hear my voice yeah. recorded being played back. Is that like a common thing for people? I mean, do do girls sound like Kermit the Frog? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Miss, Miss Piggy? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, but I don't think you sound like Kermit the Frog at all. I don't think you sound like yeah. Kermit the Frog. I don't even want to do it. Do we sound, like Kermit? Good, yeah. do we sound like Kermit the Frog? Yeah. I'm not good at impressions, so I won't do it. It's really not that hard. Go for it. I, that was it. I hope Kermit the Frog. Nah, it's <laughs> here. <laughs> um, so let's get into talk about the photography stuff. Okay. Um, how, when did you first get into photography? When I realized that I had no future as a person doing pottery <laughs> in like fifth or sixth grade, and then I couldn't draw and our art teacher in the small high school that we were a part of said that in Rockford in Rockford uh, they would like do art on the ceiling tiles and I never made that I wasn't good enough you're tall enough I was tall enough yeah I could have done it like <laughs> Michelangelo <laughs> but um, it was said that I wasn't an artist hmm. so because sometimes people like are all like okay artists are only people who draw it's not a vocal artist or, you know, instrumentalist, which is all very much in the arts. But I Qu think cuisinal I cuisinal artist, huh? It's cuisinal, quiz, quiz, food cuisine, 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 food artist. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I'd want to be that. I think I would eat all of it. <laughs> uh, so I think I was. I really didn't realize what level of artist I was or what kind I was until I got to my senior year. Um, and my uh, had an opportunity to be in a photo class with the same teacher that I had my small engines class in. And in my small engines class, or my small engines teacher actually gave me a B plus, even though I never got the, the um, engine running again. Uh, it was a running lawnmower before. But then um, I basically figured out that um, Photography and that realm was where I was very felt very able to express myself. But all of it back then was more wildlife oriented. <clears throat> Before I ever went towards becoming an artist, I thought I was going to be a game warden. So game warden. Yeah, my dad was a policeman, but I didn't want to be a full-on policeman. <laughs> I wanted to be something kind of in the middle um, and love the outdoors. Um, and then I thought I was going to, as I went into photography, I thought I was going to be um, a bird photographer, an outdoor photographer. And uh, my best friend growing up, his dad was a director of creative resources for Target and said, you'll never make any money or be able to support a family taking pictures of birds. So 
that opened my eyes to commercial photography and um, being able to do things like uh, catalogs or um, you know products for different companies, uh, shooting lawyers, sorry, photographing lawyers. <laughs> um, and then just basically anything that would be used to help people um, promote their brand uh, or be able to um, increase product sales is all kind of what I've done. And then through the years, as I got to a point where I actually uh, liked people more, <laughs> uh, realized that the human story is a, a something that means an enormous amount to me. And so that's something that moves me in probably the last 10 years as a photographer has been the human story, and that human story can be what they make as a product, um, but it can also be where they're at in their life and what they've encountered. Um, so that's where I, I think I realized in my senior year of high school and knew that that was what I wanted to do. Went to tech school for it and then just kind of have been in the business or the industry in one way or another, always in that realm. Um, but in the last 10 years, it's been more focused probably on storytelling. Nielsen Studio, right? Yep. Um, so I might have answered my next question. What's, what's your favorite thing to take photos of? take photos of yeah well there's um one is people but it's not um it wouldn't be necessarily people for advertising it would be um basically like well like i did a story on you and i didn't want just oh the average worship leader you know i <coughs> number I, 35 i think i think yeah. <laughs> I Not don't that I looked. Actually, I, I did. I did look just for research purposes. If you don't know, Sean does a on, on his website. You can look at his blog. It's called American Faces, and this is where he does. He takes a picture, um, and then he writes a, a little kind of. I don't. know, It's not a backstory. It's not even really. It's just kind of his thoughts about this individual. Yep, and, and I'll ask um, a couple questions that lead me to where I want to go, not with an agenda. But it's something where I just want to know. I want to know their story, whether they're Christian or not. Um, that doesn't matter to me. Sure. I, um, I'm just not to say bold enough, but I, I love to ask questions because I think everyone has a story. As much as people don't think they have a story, we just as humans don't take enough time to, quote, sit around the campfire and figure out what each other's story is. Yeah. You know, you have a story. I mean, Schultz and being Korean doesn't necessarily go together. Neither does a Andy and Lederhosen. <laughs> um, Standing on a Swedish rug. But there's a powerful story there, yeah. and to tell some piece of that. And then there's a powerful story, you know, in something else. You know, and it, it might not be what you think. Like, I didn't, it was a different series that I had done, but I did a story of my dad that he was a cop in Plymouth for 36 years. And I thought, oh, this is going to be one of those savior of the world kind of guys. You know, this is going to be the whole story. And I realized he just said, nope, just needed a good job because I wanted to provide for you and your brother. And I'm like, oh, that's not where I wanted the story to go. And I realized that I needed to just rest and wait. And when people are telling me their story or when I'm asking a question that's going to yield something, I can't predetermine the path um, of what that answer is. And that's something that I think I've learned throughout time, you know, has been just sit and take time to get to know someone. Because there's, there's power there. There's people that sit right next to you and in the congregation that have maybe um, have gone through a, a divorce or have gone through a miscarriage or gone through loneliness, whatever it is. And until you realize that uh, realize it or take time to get to know someone there's people to your left and to your right and in front of you and in back of you that have like these powerful stories that can affect you sorry i didn't mean to bring it like down no you know? no this is good stuff <clears throat> i mean we were talking beforehand um because like i've been i've been with you both on that side where you just asked me a question and it was such a benign simple question but it 
it apparently it brought out an answer that gave you the ability to to write this you know blog just chunk that uh, I didn't even realize I was sharing that or that was what you were interested in listening to mm -hmm. and then I've also been on the side where you've done some stuff here for Northridge remember a few years ago for Easter we did this video series with uh, a handful of different people here at Northridge and while you did some of them at your studio uh, some of them you did here and you and Scott are behind camera and just asking these simple questions and you just have this knack for asking things in a way that does bring out a, a lot of stuff in people. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious of what, where that kind of sensitivity comes from. And I'm alluding to something that we were talking about before we started, uh, started streaming. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. um, maybe, I think so, but we'll just make it maybe up as we that go. Ex that experience going through what you did just from a health physical um, helped you become more aware of what other people might potentially be going through in their life. Yeah, um, the health thing wasn't, I mean, that's a piece of it, but probably the bigger piece is at whatever, five years old, I was probably about as tall as you were. <laughs> um, and then through, uh, and then with a, about an inch overbite. So I was pretty readily teased um, as a kid and took a lot of that onto myself and just realized how much pain that caused me in high school. So even though I'm a football player size guy, it was kind of like um, the emotions, you know, that got drawn out or how I felt about myself. Um, I've always had a compassion for people and um, I, I'm also a very black and white person, but in terms of the compassion side, it's like, I know people are hurting and at, at any one certain point, time in someone's life they're hurting no one has a perfect life um but i realized that i think that, that for me um that hurt that pain is in everyone's life at one time or another and the gift that i have on this side of what i endured as a young person gives me and i use it if you want to call it leverage it it's like i'm only going to have an opportunity i mean you're you're different i got to look at your face every week <laughs> but I also would would not put um, put a person in a place that they wouldn't feel comfortable but from that compassion side I want to give people an opportunity to share that story because somewhere out there whether it's a sad or a happy story somewhere out there there's someone who needs to hear that so when I look at like that statement it could be someone just like you who was adopted that might be going through some stuff and there's victories and there's sadnesses in your life that, you know, maybe you didn't share in what, or I didn't write. Um, but someone goes, oh, Andy's adopted. And he's turned out to be pretty decent. <laughs> if you think Andy's pretty decent, just go ahead and leave in the comments. <laughs> if you don't think I'm decent. <laughs> don't please, say anything. <laughs> please leave something in the comments. <laughs> But I think, uh, I think for me, there's when I have the opportunity to write that, I look at it as, a, as an opportunity. And I'm blessed to be in that moment to be able to share, to hear your story or to, to hear someone else's story, you know, and, and, and to see that what that person has gone through um, or what someone still has yet to go through or what they're going through. So I think when I look at those stories, that's probably what I'm most moved by to, to do that. And then the health thing that you um, talked about, I went through hypothyroidism um, back in, when were you, when did you come on? 2010. 2010. So I think 2009, I had done a bicycle century that kind of knocked my thyroid all the way over the edge to the point where I couldn't walk like 15 feet across a room um, without being out of breath and I had trained to do a bicycle century and a friend of mine and myself did the whole thing at like 20 miles an hour so I was able to to bike fast do all of that but then at the end of it I was uh, not able to walk and then I was also 
um, overly emotional. I mean, like more emotional than I normally am. <laughs> Just in case Christine comments. <laughs> um, but I, I walked through that, and and Christine and the family walked through it, and it was a hard time because it was something where I couldn't focus. I mean, like not like with my lens, but I couldn't focus on what I was doing as a person. Um, the housing bubble and everything was affecting the business to a significant point. And I, at different times, didn't feel like going on. You know, like, um, and I don't know if it would have been like full out suicide or whatever it was, but it was like, you know, my brain was saying you shouldn't be around anymore and stuff like that. And then throughout that process, whew, um, the Lord laid on a phrase, Lord laid on my heart a phrase to live for the tomorrows. I know it says we're not supposed to worry about the tomorrows, but this was just live. Just take the next step and the next breath and the next day and to live for that because you have something better to live for than what you feel like you're dying in right now. Mm-hmm. So it was it was the the life that was ahead. It was seeing grandkids. It was seeing um, marriages. It was getting to know different friends and all that that, had I been short-sighted at that point, that that I would have, I would not have been living for the tomorrows. I would have been dying to the todays, yeah. yeah, or whatever. But but that phrase has been so powerful. Um, in the very much into archery, I put it on the back of um, my bow that says "Live for the tomorrows." So whenever I'm shooting, I see it. I have had it just in my brain, and I just I try to live that way. I laugh that way. Um, try to be goofy, you know, as much as I possibly can. Try to make people feel uncomfortable in a funny kind of way, <laughs> both to me and to them. <laughs> I've been there. Yep. <laughs> um, I've been known, like we talked about, the Love and Lumberjacks, um, to cook a fish on stage while there was a banquet going on. Was um, it the Valentine's banquet? Yeah, yeah it was Valentine's that. banquet. <laughs> That wasn't on the menu, <laughs> <laughs> uh. but I I think uh, so. I think if I remember what your question was, what's my favorite kind of photography? It's people and it's storytelling and it's the human it's the human story that I think moves me. Well, and, and one of the things that <clears throat> I think is maybe the hardest thing to come across in photography in a picture is the sense of empathy. And I think you, all of your pictures, if you look at any of his collections, whether it's here in the building or on his, on his blog, they all have this certain vibe to them, a certain look. And I know there's, you know, processing, post, you know, post-processing, all this kind of stuff, but uh, it's more than that. It's, it's the, the way that you bring people into the way you're looking at the world and look, you're looking at a person or you're looking at, a landscape or an object or whatever it is, there's a certain look or feel to it. And I think one of those emotions to me that at least comes out through your photography is, is this sense of empathy. And I think that bridges that gap between you, the person in the picture, or the people in the picture, or and the people or person looking at. Um, I think it's an incredibly hard thing to do. I mean, I don't know if that's what you were, trying to look for maybe you can describe kind of the look and feel that you try to go for when yeah you're, when you're taking pictures um if i'm if i'm not held in by what a client wants or, or if the client's hiring me for that specific look that you're talking about um you know you and i i'm not 50 feet back when you and i are sitting here you know we're six feet or i'm going down lower <laughs> um get back up there okay but when let's, I'm... Let's get the water out of you. Let's get, <laughs> it's like right on oh, camera. Oh, <laughs> well, I was trying to... This isn't my good side. <laughs> I don't have a good side. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> I'm just functional. <laughs> um, but you and I engage in a relatively close conversation level. You know, it's usually... People are usually about this far away. Most often when portraits are shot, it's like farther back, make the background all soft. Um, and while I do that for some things, most of the stuff that you'll see on my blog is at this level or at this distance. There's a certain lens that I would use, um, which is more uh, 
more based on the human eye. And then I go to generally a space within a person or to a person that would make them feel slightly uncomfortable. But then I come back and um, I basically will say, work it, babe, or you have something in your teeth <laughs> or some random joke that gets real. See, like, like your, if your you <laughs> teeth muscles are doing it right now. Like when you do portraits for Northridge over, you know, in that area over there, if you've ever had your family portrait with him, oh man, it's just a trip. Almost everybody coming out of your session, your quick, I mean, it's only like three minutes that you're with them. They're all smiling. Yep. And they're all laughing. And you just have this wonderful way of, uh, you said uncomfortable, but at the same time, it's just joy. And it's yeah, and that's that's how I want to I want to leave people that way because like I don't know what they're doing I don't know if they're going to a cancer appointment or you know whatever it might be and if I have the opportunity, uh, albeit maybe a blessing to change that feeling and to change that smile or if they had a cranky kid, which I know most people at Northridge don't have cranky kids, <laughs> um, that's at other churches, not at Northridge. <laughs> Um, but if I can change how, how the parents feel, or if I can change how a couple is going through or whatever, um, I remember, uh, one of the last opportunities that I had to take of, uh, take photos of Tim and Linda Kreps, mm -hmm. this side of heaven. I got Tim to give Linda a kiss on cheek. I mean, like I'm just bawling cause I knew what the stages of cancer that he was going through but I knew that that was something special for them mm -hmm. and, I, and I knew that 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 memory of that is something that's special and I can give that gift and I might not always be in a good mood I'm often cranky when it comes to like it, the hard part is like when you serve is often when you feel like the most put out sometimes and then well at least me maybe I'm abnormal oh sorry um but I, but then when I get in the mix of doing all of it, I realize, okay, this is a gift that I get to give to the people. Um, and the Lord has blessed me with an ability to photograph and to make people feel cherished with a photo. Um, and that's just something that I, I just see as a gift every single time, whether it's someone like Tim Krebs or someone like Andy Schultz. Yeah. I mean, no, you're, you're a decent guy. <laughs> I'm okay. You have a really good way of uh, just of doing that. It's just, uh, I think it's pretty amazing, and it's a pretty. I think it's a pretty important part of. It's a tool of of your your style of photography. And I didn't realize it for a long time. I, I think once I got away from being so commercial, like this is what I do for a layout. You know, if it's for a Cheerios box or whatever it might be, I'm just using that as an example. Um, if you don't like the Cheerios box, don't judge me because it's not my photograph. <laughs> um, but I realized that once I got to, to do some of my own thing, it started to create in me a different kind of desire to get to know people at a deeper level. Um, I One of the first series that I started to do was a series called 15 Faces. And um, I had this idea that I was going to tell this really awesome story and it was going to be of like a waitress and a greasy spoon up in Walker, Minnesota at the Outdoorsman Cafe. I'm like, oh, I had this great idea. Walk into the restaurant and all there was was really cheap tinsel on the wall, really bad wallpaper and substandard Wayne's coating. Not the restaurant that I had in my head. <laughs> And I'm just like all grumpy and Christine and I were sitting, you know, I'm like there and nothing, my camera's just sitting on the table. It's not doing anything. And behind I'm listening to a story unfold, you know, and I know you're not supposed to eavesdrop, but I think the Lord was like turning my ear backwards, you know, like here, listen to this. And it was um, our waitress had asked the couple that had been there doing a Bible study if they would pray for, um, for her as her daughter was getting out of uh, detox. Mm. And this was the daughter's third time and that this would be, you know, this special time. And, and the couple just stopped and they, they prayed 
and I realized, okay, that's my story. Well, as a commercial photographer, I usually don't go, hey, I was just listening to your story. <laughs> um, could I take a photo of you and basically tell the whole story that you guys just talked about? Yeah. And, and I, I turned, Christine's like, well, I think that's your story. <laughs> and um, so I turned around and asked them, and they said, sure, that I could tell it. I just couldn't take a photo of them looking at me. You know, they just wanted to have their Bibles or laughing, and um, their pastor had encouraged them to go around to the small towns up in northern Minnesota to um, just pray and to do their Bible studies there. They were, a, they were an older couple. But it was just this rich story, and what I realized, I can't force the story. I can't make it what I want. So, like, even if I went back to my dad's story, I can't make him be the savior of the world. Although he was an extremely good guy and whatever, he actually just wanted a good job and and to support his family. Well, that is that is a life-changing thing, you know, for me. Yeah. Um, but But it's like I learned so much from that first one that I can't, I can't push a story where I want it to go, and I can't force it to be told to me faster. So sometimes I have to just sit and wait, especially when you do stories of senior citizens. <laughs> they take about twice as long. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a richness there that, you know, they've been able to polish that story a bunch of times or to, you know, to cut out the stuff that, or, or to add more for all I know. <laughs> but there's this richness that's just there that I think is so cool. And, and I think the human human story, no matter how grand or um, how, you know, how early it is in their, in their stage, whether it's a kid going here to children's church, they have their own story, you know, of how they see Jesus versus someone who's 80 and who's been to war or whatever. Uh, if you haven't seen any of these you should go to his blog which is on his website which is um nielsen dash studios.com yeah and it's n-i-e-l-s-e-n nielsen dash studios.com and you'll see on the navigation at the top it says blog mm -hmm. uh, what are you up to 130 something no 60 something oh really yeah oh, i thought you were over 100 no it kind of got a little slower recently so if you have stories that are interesting, don't take it personally if I don't do them. But if there's something, and when I say interesting... If, how about this? If you know somebody mm -hmm. that has an interesting story, um, maybe ask them uh, if, if that would be something they'd be interested in doing, and then get in touch with Sean. Yep. And instead of, maybe instead of promoting yourself, promote somebody else. Yeah, and it's not political. It's not specifically Christian. Um, I don't want it to ever be that way. Yeah. And there's obviously that thread in my being that's in how I look at, at the human story, but it's not agenda driven or anything like that. So I'm, and I'll be the first person to not do that. I'm pretty blunt when it comes to that kind of thing. <laughs> um, I just want to be able to tell the human story and to, to leave the world in a better place than what I found it. So what, if, um, just kind of switch topics real quick. What, inspired you to first do these photos in the building here do you actually want to know yeah i'm ask actually asking at other churches i had seen grandma's cross stitch in <laughs> in uh in frames and not that grand not my grandma and and not necessarily anybody else's grandma that i knew but it's like i saw artwork that to me while it was important to family wasn't necessarily important to the the fabric of the church. I kind of see the church fabric, as a... Fabric, cross-stitch. Yeah, cross-stitch, I know. I see the... We'll, we'll go back to it. I see the church as a quilt, and each of us are kind of woven into it or stitched into it. You know, you have a different life than I do, or you've lived a different life. Mm -hmm. But your story or your part of Northridge or, or whatever church you're a part of, you're a part of this, this quilt. And... Um, so I didn't want to see that kind of stuff come into the building. I know that probably sounds like um, that I'm better than anyone. I don't see that. Honestly, I've, I think I wrote a document that I couldn't have any personal gain or any of that from this. Um, I don't even really want people to know. I mean, like, you've blown my cover now, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to put that up, it was uh, I saw life of the church. And... Um, I saw 
you know, a kid smiling or someone eating a hamburger. I think Sam Searstad, you know, Sam the Hammer, the drummer, um, I think he was up with like a mouthful of food for a long time. Yeah. And um, that, that, that to me is the church. That, that's what the church is. And, and so not wanting the, the cross stitch or the weird kind of Jesus on the water art kind of thing. And, and not that that's bad. I just, I saw so much of the life of what Northridge is, is the people. Yeah. And, and I wanted to be able to show that or have the opportunity for people to see that and to feel comfortable. So, you know, you coming here and seeing that and reacting to it, um, that was awesome to hear it. And I'm glad that that was something that moved you, um, you know, to consider Northridge as your home and a place that you would serve with your gifts. And when I look at like the photos that go in there, it's like I don't turn my lens towards any one certain person. You know, um, there's obviously some kids, when I'm photographing kids that are more in my lens than others, you know, depending upon if they're an extrovert or an introvert. <laughs> um, but I, I've seen it as an opportunity just to, to photograph people. It's been, I've seen it as, um, tools when people have walked up and down the hall and it's like, oh, this is, you know, this is my son or, or whatever it might be that they're talking about. And it's neat to see that and people don't know that it was me doing the, you know, who put that there. And, and I know it's kind of hard to miss me, but I try to like... They do now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fly under the radar. Yeah. And I think the big part for me was not um, not wanting not wanting to have to specifically adhere to like what would go up on the walls too, you know, something that could change and something that could be the life. Um, and whether that's words, you know, using abstract imagery and then putting people's favorite verses that, that to me actually has been more powerful than the photos that I put in because I got to, to hear or see and, you know, see people's verses and then put them to a photo that that whatever I felt went behind there, and some there's been a few or several actually scenarios where people went, oh, that's exactly what I wanted behind there or thought would be kind of cool, and it's like I had no idea, but just knowing that some of those life verses have helped people through some um, tough situations, through some incredible up, you know, high level, um, awesome times, and that's you know those verses of mean a myriad of things to people. So I think to me that's been probably my favorite one. Mm -hmm. um, years ago, what kind of actually started all the photos was uh, Christine, um, who helps or does some of the children's music stuff, um, said you and Brad Martin should do a video of the, the kids for Mother's Day. Uh, one Little Heartbeat at a Time by Stephen Curtis Chapman. So she had the song and everything picked out, and I said, sure, but I'm only going to do one photograph of each family's kid. You know, and I'm, she's like, so which of your four are you going to choose? <laughs> and I realized that, again, it's like going back. It's like it's an opportunity for me to learn. Yeah. But I realized, well, I can't excludes <laughs> i really can't exclude some so we actually i think had to double the length of stephen curtis chapman's song <laughs> but it was like another learning experience for me that i i can't control or i don't want to control what's what's being done and it's like using the voice of a wife sometimes speaks pretty loudly in a guy's ear um but that was even something that kind of started how i looked at you know how it would be neat to have frames that are um, clear and that just have the wall behind them and then the photos just kind of float in there as well. Um, so to me it's just been something that I've seen as a great opportunity um, to learn. I've become a better photographer by getting in people's um, personal space um, both from talking to them or you know just photographing them at a very close range and putting them up on the wall. And no one generally feels uncomfortable. And if I know that they're going to feel uncomfortable, I won't put that one up. Yeah. Like I have someone who I always shoot a photo of them when they're eating at the... <laughs> at, at the I um, always feel uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I always make sure you're, you're at least one of them, and I usually wait until you have something in your mouth. 
And then there's a, another person who I've just had a lot of fun over the years um, taking the photos. They never make it. I just it's <laughs> it's like a yearly thing for me. Yeah. It's, I don't think I've liked any of my uh, like the staff photos that we have <laughs> because you always catch me. You always say something just ridiculous. Well, you look like a German soldier when you come in here. <laughs> You do that kind of thing. You just got to relax, man. Just hang loose. Yeah. Pretend you're in Hawaii. Yeah. That it might work. That might. I'm pretty relaxed now. It's like hanging loose. Is it this? Yeah, this. Okay. I never Is know. there, um, got a couple more questions for mm -hmm. you. I just, that's fantastic. You're missing out if you're not listening to this stuff. Um, is there anywhere that you have not shot, like a location that you, you would like to shoot? Uh, in Minnesota? I you, anywhere. I know you, you know, kind of gravitated more towards your passion people because of the story aspect. Um, but I don't, I don't think, I mean, you see all of your, your, all of your extra shots and throwaway shots, but you know, I've never seen. <laughs> oh no, a, I never mess up. <laughs> I've never <laughs> seen a bad photo of yours. Um, I don't know if you still have a, any passion to, either landscape or cityscape photography or whatever. Um, but I am, I'm assuming that it maybe elevates above product, you know, commercial photography, taking pictures of, you know, landscapes or whatever, or animals or whatever. I would say landscapes to me are, are just um, situational. So if I'm there... It's like I, I wouldn't set out to like go to Kathmandu to photograph, you know, Mount Everest. Um, I think I did that right. It's about as I think it's in Kathmandu, Mount Everest. I don't know. I I was there. Well, I know I've and seen I your pictures. photos. <laughs> I think it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, Everest is there. K two is there. Annapurna is there. Yeah. I think I think for me it's like where I'm at. Um, I mean, I grew up. I think part of it is maybe I grew up on a policeman's salary. So, like, to me, going to Walker, Minnesota was like, whoa, <laughs> we're going on a vacation. <laughs> but nothing wrong with Walker. Yeah. It's just that's what I knew. So, so to me, like, when um, we were down in Sedona, it's like Sedona was, like, mind-boggling to me. And it's like I'm soaking it in. Or Zion is, is amazing. Um, and I'm soaking it in. So I, to answer your question, I, I – you know, is there something like in that realm? I think landscapes to me are situational, and uh, sorry, and I'm moved by that opportunity. If I were to, to just be able to, to to be put into a situation, it would be, um, as an example. I don't know where this is going, but we'll we'll go there anyway. Um, Last year, we did the food distributions, and one of them was down to North Minneapolis. And to realize that there was a food desert to the west and to the east, and people had just extreme need, um, much different than what we're used to here. And I'm not trying to take advantage of that human story that's going on, but to be in a situation to be able to, to tell something like that, so something that's at like this even deeper level than what I than what I'm taking in for my blog. So it's maybe telling a broader story, which is nothing that a commercial photographer like myself is used to. I mean, it's like literally you're sitting there taking in their their life. And they're, when I say there, it's like someone who's not Sean Nielsen, six foot five white guy on a goat farm. It's someone who's living in Northeast, Northeast North Minneapolis or wherever and just seeing their their life and walking alongside them. So I think to have to have that relationship with someone would be something that would be for me and it wouldn't even necessarily be that I'd take much more than one photo, but it would maybe be that I'm living life with them. I'm I'm laughing. I'm having something this this life together sharing life, you know. I can go out and have a s'more whenever I want, but what does my, what does the person, what does my brother or sister in North Minneapolis have as the same opportunity? So I, I think for me it's like having deeper relationships and maybe being able to tell that story. 
would be something that I would want to do that would also push me probably beyond <laughs> what I'm capable of taking in in terms of a story and maybe that's something that would push me more mm. which also actually causes me a fair amount of anxiety not not like a anxiety in terms of you know something that I have to go see a psychologist about but anxiety in terms of this is so far out of my realm that it's going to push me beyond what I am normally able to take in and and do and be a part of. Do you think those moments like that challenge you as a photographer and make you better? Or I think the they, potential. I think they first challenge you as a uh, as a fellow human being. <laughs> sure, of course. Because um, you you have to put yourself in a place of vulnerability, and then as a photographer or a, an artist. I mean, whether you were to sit down and play guitar or, or play with them in musically or draw or whatever it might be, you have to take in their life. And you have to, you know, as I mentioned before, um, me making the story what I was wanted it to be wasn't what I think wasn't what the Lord wanted me to do to become the storyteller that I am today. But it it wasn't also what the Lord wanted from me in that time. And even now it's like, I think, yes, going, going to the point, it's, it's something that it's just out of the realm of my ability to do normally. And not that I'm a bad person for it. It's just like, Oh goodness, I've got to, I've got to react to this person's struggles or their joys and I've got to put that through my filter of what I grew up with out in the country, you know, surrounded by agricultural fields and a river. Sometimes that doesn't fit into what is going on in North Minneapolis or what's going on in Monticello or wherever it is. So it's it's something that's like new to me. Um, I've had people tell me that I can actually um, like talk to a, probably a gas pump just because I can. <laughs> Just because I'm asking questions, and it, it's um, and Pastor Ben has said you're a very inquisitive person, you know, wanting to know about a person. So I want to know what your heart is. Some of it's I want to know if you and I can have some common thread just outside of being just humans, and so that I can get to know you and to to get to know a piece of Andy. So if I'm watching you up on stage, or I'm seeing you sit next to me in the congregation or I see you at Target, I want to know, oh, okay, how's it going? You know, that you have two dogs or a rake for weird purposes in your Jeep. That's stuff that's fodder for conversation, but it's also like understanding your story and who you are. Not to say the rake part, but the Jeep part. <laughs> so you've been la uh, lately, I don't know what the last, I don't know if it started with, last year going downtown with the food distribution but doing a lot more with make a different stuff here at northridge mm -hmm. um why um so the first the first reason to why uh, and one of the first make a difference scenarios that i did i mean like if i were if, if we were to say like make a difference things um i gave portraits away to um, Mobile Hope Dayton um, in terms of, and those portraits would be of residents within the Dayton trailer park. And that was the first opportunity and I thought, I thought, oh, this is a great opportunity to give por portraits to families. And um, part of the reason why, why the, the trailer parks are so important to me is my, uh, one of my best friends growing up the guy who actually brought me to Christ, uh, grew up in a trailer home uh, in a trailer park in Rockford, Minnesota. And he profoundly impacted my life and what my future, I, I don't think I'd be sitting across from you, very much grew up in a home that didn't have any kind of religion in it. Um, not that God was a hated thing, it just wasn't something that we, we did as a family. Um, we were more about going to McDonald's than, you know, looking at a cross or something. Uh, but when I, when I look at what that friend um, brought to me was a new life in Christ and seeing 
it, there wasn't as much um, difference between you know where people live in the developments and the trailer parks back when I was a kid, but there still was a significant difference. And in the high school that we went to, we didn't necessarily say, oh, I'm from a trailer park or oh, I'm from Greenfield or Rockford or wherever we lived. Um, but I saw that that person loved me no matter what, even though he only had the life of living in a trailer home. And not that that was less than me, but it was like, okay, this is just, he has joy and he has a lot less than me. And my dad ended up being kind of his dad a little bit too. Um, so there's this, and or a father figure kind of guy for this person. And so when I looked at the impact of that, um, I was in church here and heard something about mobile hope. And then I'm like, you know, I felt like the Lord kind of, uh, this will sound very Minnesotan, but hit me over the head with a two by four. <laughs> um, saying you should probably go talk to Dan. Um, I'm like, oh, you know, and I went, mm, okay, cool. You know, it's like, I again, I, it's like overthinking something. Um, so I thought about it for like a week or two more, and it's like every time I was back in church, kept on hearing something about Mobile Hope. For all I know, it was never actually said. It's just I heard Pastor Ben, and maybe he was just saying Mobile Hope, Mobile Hope, Mobile Hope. <laughs> if he's listening, I'm sorry, Pastor Ben. <laughs> um but I was, I was hearing that in my heart and to, to basically use the, the talent or gift or whatever, um, talent I'll just, of taking portraits, um, but to be able to give that away. So I met with Mobile Hope and four ladies from the trailer park to make sure I wasn't doing it for like some story to go into, you know, magazine about, oh, look at this situation or that situation. And um, once they kind of vetted me and realized, oh, he really is just doing this because he wants to. Because I told them basically the story that I told you about my friend. Um, so I, I gave that away and I realized that it wasn't about the portraits, but it was about all the opportunities that Mobile Hope could help bring to the families. And to see that get Sean out of the way, um, that the make a difference was happening at a deeper level other than just the portraits. Now, I was also, within that time and different circumstances of people, there was a, a dad and a daughter that probably would never have got their time together, but they came and had this portrait, and it could have been the one happy opportunity that, that for that week or whatever that time, and I could, I could see that change in that moment. Yeah. Um, and to know that that was impactful to that family but overall to see the difference that it had made um, outside of the Sean giveaway, it was this deep, truly making a difference. And it, it was just that uh, I was, um, I don't know if it's okay to say this, but I was a tool for God um, in a good way. <laughs> I'm a tool. You know. <laughs> You're a tool. Yeah, we're, both, we're all tools, you know, in good ways for Jesus in one way or another. So that opportunity was something that I saw. Um, and it's, you know, the, the food distributions were something just being in the midst of stuff locally. Um, while I'd like to be able to truly, you know, speak Spanish, I took two weeks, dropped out, uh, av in high school. So I have no Spanish abilities. Um, not that that ultimately matters, but making a local difference has been something to me where I'm not jumping in an airplane, going across cultures. So for me, I've looked out our back door as a church and have seen their stuff, stuff, there's opportunities um, right out our back door. It could be your neighbor. Um, it, you know, it, it could be you cutting their grass or in the, the case of um, the trailer parks, there's a lot of needs there and that you could figure out what's needed either by talking to some of us or going to Mobile Hope specifically. Um, but in terms of making a difference, it really is just seeing the needs right out our, our, out our back door. And it was, uh, it was interesting, kind of back on the Mobile Hope pieces, uh, had an opportunity this year to do portraits at the Corcoran site, uh, at the Corcoran trailer park. And that was actually a part of the school district that I went to. Hmm. And I never stepped foot in there. 
um, even when I was a kid. Uh, so I'd only known the one directly in Rockford as a trailer park, um, but I knew or had friends that had lived at the uh, at the one in Corcoran. And just driving through, it just the Lord broke my heart and just said, "There's so much need here." I mean, you could see into the walls from the outside, and some. And then the next one is is great, and you just look at that and you go. You, you look inside yourself and go, okay, what, what's an opportunity and a way that I can help? And, and for me, I'm not handy. I wear plaid. Don't let it fool you. <laughs> I can cut down trees. They may hit things. <laughs> but um, I can give portraits away, and I can help be a part of seeing things and, um, and help bring different people together. And I think the Lord has, has given me just a heart for the local side, you know, because of that and just because of what I've seen. And I saw my dad as a policeman in Plymouth, not having really any Christian background, be someone who is more like Jesus than, than sometimes what I've seen walking the streets of the world, calling themselves a Christian. And so if I can, if I can live more like that, I want to try to be more like that. I've still got a long ways to go. Yeah. Like, you know, miles. We all do. <laughs> um, that's awesome. If you want to join Sean doing, uh, making a difference, um, talk to Dan. And uh, make sure you check out his blog, Nielsen-Studios.com. Studio, 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 plural. Studios. Plural. I only have one studio. but it, <laughs> That's why I was asking. I know. It Niels sounds more impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Nielsen-Studios. Branding is basically all about a little bit of Wizard of Oz. Pay no attention to the man, man behind, behind the, the curtain, camera. Yeah. Um, Nielsen-studios.com and then click on the blog. Uh, not just see some fantastic pictures, but read some fantastic stories of people. Um, and then just come and introduce yourself to Sean. He's here most weekends sitting right in front of me. <laughs> sitting right in front of Andy. And, and right in front of a bunch of shorter people behind him in the rows behind. yeah i sorry but you know it's like the first two rows are the cheapest actually the cheap the cheap, cheap seats, seats. Yeah. Um, actually i don't have to pay yeah. there's not a plaque there or anything nope, it's nope. just where come we and take his seat yeah you could take it yeah. you might throw kim kringen for a loop because <laughs> he, he actually saw i think um dave and amy belchock there sitting. was a few weeks where they they were there first, and you guys had to sing out, sit out on the oh yeah the far wing. Oh, it threw Kim. Kim came <laughs> over, and he's like, "What are we gonna do?" <laughs> it was like, pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, but hey, man, thanks for coming and oh, it was fun. talking and just. Um, I don't like sharing. being on this side of the camera. Yeah, neither do I. I I like looking at your eyes. You have nice eyes, Andy. Can you see them? <laughs> no, they're very dark brown. <laughs> well, and they squinty. Um, I didn't make that reference. I did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here, guys. All right. Thanks, Sean. You're welcome. Bye, everybody.